Uh, we're starting the show taking a look at the stories making the headlines. Uh, to help us do that today, we have Andrew Neil and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Um, well, before we begin, Ruth, oh, well. I've got to find out from Andrew. Oh, Neil. yes. There must Words. be a word that you find difficult to pronounce in your time. Yes, a, a word I have really great difficulty with is uh, I'll pay. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Nicola, one that gives you difficulty? Every time, secretary. Secretary, secretary, ah, secretary. Yes. Well, sec yeah, secretary. Yeah, secretary. Secretariat is another one, yeah. Anyway, very good. No, Ruth? What were we talking about? Oh, yes, um, talking about slogans. So, uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, um, is saying they're, they're ditching the stay-at-home messaging that we've all got so used to now. And there's a new one coming. Are you ready? Get testing. Go. This is going to be a new campaign, apparently, ahead of reopening of schools next month. Nicola, what do you think of the slogan? Do we need another slogan? Do you think it helps people understand where we're at with this pandemic? I think slogans can help people understand where we're at with the pandemic. I don't particularly think that this one does. Um, ultimately, when kids go back to school, the stay-at-home message for the rest of the population still exists, presumably, because people won't be able to do anything other than go to work, or go to the shops. Get ready, get testing is a, a good slogan in the sense that they're introducing these 400,000 allegedly uh, lateral flow tests every day for homes and families uh, across the country. But are you ready? Get testing, go. I think there's a false sense of security there because as we know, these lateral flow tests aren't 100% effective. Yes, and also Andrew, we also know that a lot of people are concerned about testing in case they get a positive test and they can't go to work. And so, you know, they're being relied on to be honest, but some people, you know, might not be because of their, their financial and personal circumstances. No, some people might, but you can't control everybody. The slogan, I think, is quite right. It's not great at all. It's a bit confusing. But more important than any slogan is the policy. And it's a, a, a massive policy that's now being rolled out 50 million people already vaccinated, all adults to be vaccinated by August or September uh, at the latest. 68% of the population to be able to get these rapid uh, tests uh, out, all school children, parents, teachers as well. I mean, these are huge steps forward. And uh, they do suggest that we don't know by how much, but as we head into spring and on to summer, it does seem if the policy works, the lockdown bit by bit will be dismantled, which has got to be good news in a quite miserable February at the moment. Yeah, and you're talking miserable. about staying alert. Is Nicola Sturgeon more alert than um, the other uh, leaders of the UK nations? She always seems to be one step ahead. Do you agree, disagree with that? And I'm talking about uh, Scottish schools uh, returning from next Monday. Uh, yeah, she I... said perceived always to be one step ahead. There's no question about that. She's much better at the presentation than Boris Johnson is. She speaks straightly, coherently in sentences, something the Prime Minister isn't always famous for. Whether there's that much difference between the policies is uh, it's a week or 10 days in it most of the time. The vaccination rollout hasn't gone as well in Scotland as it has in, in England. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, number of deaths from COVID per 100,000 people is lower in Scotland than it is in England. But overall, if you step back from it, if you to look at this country from the outside, you would conclude that for all the uh, emphasis on the differences, policy overall, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, hasn't really been that different. It's had huge failures like the care homes in the early days and huge successes like the vaccine rollout we have now. Nicola, where do you stand in terms of a roadmap or wanting to know what the future has in hold? Are you happy to go along with things and be told what to do or do you want to just know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and pretty sharpish? I think we all know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I know that on this show we like to speak about the positives as soon as possible. We, we also don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We don't want false hope. And I think at this point, taking things slow, as slowly as possible. Right now, if someone said to me, you can go on holiday in September, as excited as I might be for it, as much as it might be a boost to my mental health, 
ultimately, I don't believe that it would happen. Right now, we've got to focus on positives, but the positive truths. And I think there's a lot of those around at the moment to hold on to. Um, I think to that's uh, right. We don't want to blow it. You know, we've yeah. come so far and we've been through yeah. so much that we don't want to blow it. And, and, and if it means for a successful exit from lockdown, we have to do it a bit more slowly, then why not? We need to get yeah. the vaccine right. We need to get the testing right. That's how we save lives in the future, is how we get the economy going again. The worst thing we could do is to rush out of this lockdown, suddenly find the virus is spreading all over the place. There is a new mutation has come in as well. And we're talking about a fourth lockdown. I'd rather be cautious uh, than be Absolutely. cavalier. It's uncharted territory, you know. No governments have ever done this before. So I think we just need to get them to take their time and be sure that what they're doing is right. Yeah, and as much as we're getting excited possibly and thinking about this, get ready, get testing, go. Let's not forget, 1.7 million people were added to the clinically vulnerable shielders list yesterday. Shielding community that are so often overlooked um, in the press briefings. I think it was a real slap in the face to that community that the day after the weekly briefing, it was announced that 1.7 million people were added to that list. Andrew, there is a UN Security Council meeting today being uh, chaired by our Foreign Secretary, uh, Dominic Raab. And there's a, there seems to be a bit of an irony about what he's asking here, because he's asking for a ceasefire. Um, but ceasefires in Yemen and Somalia and Ethiopia so that people can be vaccinated. So we get everybody vaccinated and then as business as usual, you can kill each other after that. What do you make of this? Uh, I think it's a bit of grandstanding in a way. Sadly, I mean, nothing would be better or please me more than to have ceasefires in all of these places. The situation in Yemen is probably the greatest human catastrophe in the globe uh, at the moment. The UN has no power to cause ceasefires there. Uh, the weapons are still pouring in. People are still fighting. Uh, and, you know, if you live there, getting a vaccination, I mean, it seems so important to us uh, here in the West because we are largely pretty prosperous and, you know, we can get the vaccination. I'm afraid for children in Yemen, a vaccination against COVID is probably about priority 10 or 15. Uh, so I don't really understand what they're on about, on about here. The far bigger challenge is to make sure that, this, that we create, we manufacture enough vaccines so that as quickly as possible, we can vaccinate everybody mm -hmm. around the globe because it's only by doing that uh, that we will all end up safe. It is, after all, it's a global pandemic. It is. It is, Nicola. You know, it is a global pandemic. And then we need everybody to be vaccinated, don't we? Absolutely. Until the, you know, the largest proportion of the planet are vaccinated, we won't be protected against you know, very fast-moving mutations of the virus, etc. This um, call for a ceasefire isn't unprecedented. It has happened before. It happened in Afghanistan in 2001, um, where I believe 5.7 million children were vaccinated against polio. So it's not unprecedented. Um, but, you know, we, I think we'd all agree that we wish that there could be permanent um, states of ceasefire across the world. Nicola, uh, changing the subject completely, yeah. let's talk about Judy Murray's turkey neck, because everybody else seems to be. Um, and I say this that kindly fine. because Judy herself uh, released these pictures. So she has had a £4,500 treatment, non-surgical treatment, to uh, reduce wrinkling on her neck and... Um, Lots of people are talking about it. Today, there's a big double page in one of the newspapers of various other women who apparently have had certain treatments. Um, do you think it's something that it's only women who would get this attention and their turkey necks? Of course it is. Of course. It, there's always this pressure. And, and good on Judy. You know what? Well, I don't judge any woman for having, you know, paid for cosmetic treatments, um, surgical or otherwise, if that's what they need to make themselves feel better. But sometimes I often feel that by speaking about it quite openly like this in the press, although on one hand it might say to women, you know, if you're feeling insecure about this, there's a, a procedure available. But on the other hand, it just piles on more pressure to, for more women to think, oh mm -hmm. God, do I need to have this done? I think that women yeah. should be celebrated for ageing. Andrew, <laughs> Andrew I'm, just, I'm just saying, if you're ever passing... It's the Synergy Skin Clinic in Glasgow. <laughs> and it's the... Just ask for the Morpheus 8 treatment. 
<laughs> yeah, but for me, the problem for me is they may be able to deal with turkey neck, but they can't deal with turkey face. So I think it's a, <laughs> oh, a bit of a waste of time. Well, they might, they might, they might be able to. Uh, guys, thank you, thank you <laughs> thank very you much indeed. Very really much. appreciate thank your you. take on things. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Nicola and Andrew.